What's happening, everybody? Justin, Bridgewater's Finest on YouTube, Blockbuster underscore guy on Twitter, and it's 9 o'clock in the morning, so your boy needs his coffee. Welcome to week number 18 of my weekly CFL football pick show for the 2024 CFL season. We have an abbreviated week this week where we only have three games instead of the regular four. Now, coming in off of a week 17 where I wound up breaking even, I was trending pretty good through most of the week. I think I was four and two through Friday and then six and three through the first Saturday game. And then I got reverse swept in the last game and I wound up six and six. So sometimes it happens. I still feel like I'm, I'm in a pretty good place, but I got to admit, I got to kind of admit, like I'm feeling a little nervous about this week. My big win last week was against the spread where I was three and one in the four games. Now seven games over 500 picking this whole league against the spread this season. So I feel pretty darn good about that at 37 and 30. 111, 88 and two overall on the season. So I feel like we're moving in a good direction. And I think I've had a really good grasp on things over the last uh, couple of months, really. Uh, CFL Fantasy, I, I can't say the same, unfortunately. In a week where there was a ton of scoring and a ton of fantasy points to be had, I brought in 81.4. <laughs> like, it's just been... It, it's not a, quite a lost cause yet. I mean, I'm not going to reach those goals that I talked about uh, a few weeks back. It's just mathematically, it's just not going to happen. But if we can finish the season strong, maybe we can take some momentum into next year for CFL Fantasy. So yeah, 81.4 points. It was not a good showing. It was outside the top 1,600 across the whole game, outside the top 400 in Derek Taylor's league. On the season, I have 1,676.9 points, which for the whole season is barely inside the top 2,800. So again, it's been a bad couple of weeks in Fantasy. And I'm now outside the top 300 in Derek Taylor's league as well. Uh, my most outstanding player, I'm going to give it to Justin Hardy from my lineup last week. He brought in 16.1 points. It was fine. It was good. But that's a, that's a measuring stick of how the rest of the week was. Our three-game slate in Week 18 looks like this. The Winnipeg Blue Bombers, who have now clinched a playoff spot in the West Division, travel to Hamilton to take on the Ticats. Calgary comes off their bye to travel to BC to take on the Lions. And the Riders are in Edmonton taking on the Elks. A lot of betting edges and trends have kind of leveled out as the season has gone on. Home dogs still represent what's probably the best bet across the CFL over the last 30 days. They're hitting at about 62.5%. The over is also on a run of 12 and 6 over the last 18 games in the CFL, including going 3 and 1 last week. So let's get started there in Hamilton, the Ticats playing host to a Winnipeg Blue Bombers team who, once again, as I mentioned, have clinched a playoff spot. They have not clinched the West Division, but they have clinched a playoff spot. The Bombers opened the floodgates last week with a 55-point breakout offensive performance. In fact, they scored the first 31 points of that game last week against Edmonton behind 432 passing yards and six passing touchdowns from Zach Kalaros. Kenny Lawler had 130 yards receiving and two scores. Nick Dembski had 117 and two scores. Passing touchdowns to Wheatfall and Oliveira. They led that game 34 to six at the half, which is thanks for coming. A lot of the Bombers' offensive success came from the fact that they were able to stay on the field behind an astronomical 73% on second down. Edmonton had no answer for Winnipeg on that critical down all game long, and they were also perfect in the red zone. They went 3-for-3 three three from inside the 20 scoring touchdowns on a run of 10-for-12 over their last four games. You let them get in the red zone, they're going to put seven points on the board. They did allow 154 yards rushing on 22 carries, which included allowing Justin Rankin 109 yards on his 14 carries. And in the two games against Edmonton, they allowed 349 yards rushing in those two games on 45 carries, but most notably, zero rushing touchdowns. On Hamilton's side, the Ticats put together what was arguably their best second half of the entire season, erasing a 16-point deficit 
in BC against the Lions en route to a big upset on the road. They were seven and a half point dogs in that game, wound up winning the game outright. Bo Levi Mitchell topped 300 yards passing in that game. For the eighth time this season, he went over 300, and that includes three times in his last four games. But to me, the defensive turnaround here in Hamilton is real, and it's spectacular. The Ticats allowed just two touchdowns in that game, none of them through the air. It was a pair of Nathan Rourke rushing touchdowns, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. They forced five field goals in that game against the Lions, holding a lot of BC firepower to just two and five in the red zone. Three red zone opportunities, the Lions walked away with either three points or nothing. That is a huge defensive performance by the Ticats, who for their part went four for four in the red zone in that game. All of a sudden, this is a much more interesting game than it probably would have been maybe a month ago. Like, this is two teams kind of hitting their apex right at about the same time, and it just so happens now they have to play each other. Uh, for Winnipeg's side, it is too early to start resting players. As I mentioned, they have clinched the playoffs, but they're still well in the mix for that first round bye. So it's too late to, or too early, I should say, sorry, to start resting people. We don't, I think, have to start worrying about that quite yet. This is as good a stretch of Hamilton Tiger Cats football as maybe we've seen since God, what were the, the 15 and 3 2019 team. Like, I don't think I'm overblowing it by saying, like, this is the best stretch of football that they've put on the field, maybe in five years. Hamilton, though, is just two and six against the West Division. There is the idea of this being a revenge game from week 12, where, you know, Hamilton was a fairly heavy dog. They only lost that game by three points. So there is that kind of possibly revenge angle here. Genuinely, I just don't think I can bet against the Winnipeg Blue Bombers right now, especially coming off of a performance like last week. So let's take the Bombers on the road in Hamilton to beat the Ticats. On the line, Hamilton is taking plus four and a half here as a pretty solid home dog. And there's two such home dogs this week. And four and a half points, you know, given that when these two teams weren't what they are now, this was a three-point game. I get the feeling we have a pretty similar type of game upcoming here. I don't expect Winnipeg to pop off for 55 points again. I think I'm going to take that plus four and a half. If it was more marginal than that, like if it was inside of three points, then I'd, I'd be laying that out on Winnipeg. But four and a half, I think I'm going to bite. I think I'm going to take those plus four and a half points on the tie cats. It also insulates me a little bit against an upset. Total in the game set at 50 points. I do feel good about the over here. Yes, these are two, you know, the Hamilton playing better defense now than they have in a long time. Winnipeg always being a solid defense. But the league is just trending over right now. A lot of points being put on those scoreboards. So let's take the over here. Over 50 points in Hamilton, Winnipeg. I'm going to go like a 30 to 27, something like that. A lot of fireworks, high scoring game. Give me the Bombers to win, but give me the Ticats plus the four and a half points and an over on the 50 point total. We're off to BC now where the Calgary Stampeders are in town. The Stamps coming into this game off of their bye, so they will be rested, but they're coming off of just two wins in their previous eight games. They've really kind of hit close to rock bottom here. They're also still winless away from home, 0-6 on the road in 2024. At risk of missing the playoffs, get this, for the first time since 2004, they have a very uphill battle. They do have a game in hand, but they have such an uphill battle here to try to squeak into the playoffs. They're a point behind Edmonton, and Edmonton's in fourth in the West Division. They're five points behind BC, so at this point, ostensibly every game is must-win for Calgary. You want some more bizarro statistics? Here's one for you. The Stamps have not played a road game in 2024 where any of the following has not happened. Okay? So in every Stamps road game this year, the following has happened. With one notable exception, which we'll talk about. But in every road game, they've allowed 25 or more, or more than 25 points. Sorry. 
Every road game this year, they've allowed more than 25 points. In every road game this year, their starting quarterback has either thrown at least one interception or got benched. Now, it's not just Jake Mayer that does include a Logan Bonner start where he threw five picks. But every road game this year, whoever has started for the Calgary Stampeders has either thrown at least one interception or was so ineffective they got benched. And in every road game this year, with the exception of one, all the way back in week five, but every other road game this year, the Calgary Stampeders have lost the turnover battle. All of that is a recipe for no wonder they haven't won on the road this year. On BC's side of things, we have a Lions team that coughed up a 16 to nothing halftime lead against Hamilton last week, allowing 24 points. And put this in context, because it's against a team that has been very bad in the second half and particularly in the fourth quarter this year. Against Hamilton, allowed 24 points between the fourth quarter and overtime to lose that game last week despite the fact that they dominated the game on the ground, 133 yards on 21 carries and two Nathan Rourke rushing touchdowns, but as we mentioned, only two for five in the red zone absolutely buried the BC Lions last week. If they convert one more of those red zone opportunities, they probably win this game outright. Nathan Rourke with a scoreless 265 yards through the air, but also didn't throw a pick, which is good. I'd like to keep the spotlight on Nathan Rourke here for a minute. Since that kind of virtuoso Nathan Rourke performance in Touchdown Pacific, where he went for over 300 yards through three touchdowns, looked like Nathan Rourke. Since that game, he has just one passing touchdown in three starts. And he's only averaging about 226 through the air. So 226 a game one passing touchdown in three games. Now, in those three games, he's added four touchdowns on the ground. At what point does this obvious playoff team and Grey Cup contender look at five total touchdowns in three games, four of which coming on the ground from their starting quarterback, and look at that like it's not enough? Like, at what point... Do they potentially look at a guy in Vernon Adams who was having an MOP caliber start to his season, realizing he has much more command over this offense and going back to him? I don't think that's an unfair question to ask. It's going to be rainy in BC, but of course under the roof at BC Place that won't have any actual impact on the game. There's been just one game since week nine where the Calgary Stampeders have allowed under 30 points. This is a all-world bad defense right now. It's on the scoreboard. It's on the field. Just watching this defense, you understand that it's completely out of sorts. This should be a playoff-type atmosphere for both of these teams on both sides, because once again, Calgary can't afford to lose. Unfortunately, they're going to. Um, we're going to put the nail in the coffin of the Calgary Stampeders season. They will miss the playoffs for the first time since 2004. I like the BC Lions at home to get the win over Calgary. Here's my conundrum with this game. The BC Lions, for the second straight game, are laying seven and a half points as a favorite. The second straight home game as well, because they were at home last week. It didn't make any sense to me last week how they were laying that much. It makes more sense this week because Calgary has been that bad on the road. And I'm still not going to lay the points. To me, you have to be a team that is deserving of being that heavy of a favorite. If this game was Calgary in Winnipeg and Winnipeg was favored by seven and a half points, I'd say, yeah, that makes sense to me. But based off of the last couple of performances by the BC Lions, remember back in week 15, they got beat up by the Argos. They get their bye. 
Last week, they blow a big lead to the Ticats. I can't find my way to laying that many points on this BC Lions team as it exists right now. Can't do it. Total in the game set at 53 points. Maybe we're looking at a backdoor cover here. I like this to go over as well, because again, Calgary's defense, no bueno. BC's defense, I have question marks about it now too, especially based off of last week. So give me the over in this one. Let's go like a 31 to 26. So again, could very well be a backdoor cover for Calgary here, but uh, 31 to 26 final. Lions win. Give me the plus, that stinky plus seven and a half on the Calgary Stampeders over the 53 point total. And our third and final game sees the Saskatchewan Rough Riders in Edmonton to take on the Elks. And for the Riders, their defense overcomes the fact that the Riders were blanked in the red zone in their game last week, going 0 for 2, as well as 115 yards in penalties on nine penalties with a hat trick of interceptions off of Jeremiah Masoli against the Red Blacks last week. Now that only led to three points, but the fact that you displayed that you can intercept this quarterback almost at will because two of those interceptions came on back-to-back -back offensive plays, boom, boom, it completely disjoints the other offense. It completely changes what they try to do on the field. Two quick interceptions like that, and you go, oh, okay, hang on. We just turned the ball over twice in two plays. So, and you could see it on the field. You could see that their whole offensive philosophy, that being the Red Blacks, changed for like three quarters of that game. It became a bit more of a shootout. It opened up more in the fourth. But you could see in real time how the Riders' defense changed what Ottawa was trying to do on the field. It was really kind of interesting to watch. An unlikely name drove the bus offensively for the Saskatchewan Rough Riders last week. Thomas Bertrand Udon breaks out for nine carries, 72 yards, and a rush touchdown last week. So, in 25 career carries, let me just put a spotlight here on Thomas for a minute. He's been in the league for two years. In 25 career carries, he has 181 rushing yards and three touchdowns. Should we be getting the ball to this guy more? Because it kind of feels like we should. I understand that that's spread out over two seasons. So again, he can fly completely under the radar. But 181 yards, put it in this context. You've got a bell cow running back, like a three down back in the NFL. He has a game line of 25 carries for a buck 81 and three scores. You would be over the moon with that player. So I understand, obviously, this is different because this is across two seasons. But this guy's averaging 7.2 yards a carry. Like, it feels like he should probably get the ball a little bit more. The Edmonton Elks last week were on the receiving end of that aforementioned Blue Bombers beatdown. Uh, they trailed that game 34-6 at the half. Again, kind of thanks for coming. They had absolutely no answer for Zach Kalaros in that game. As I mentioned, 432 and 6 scores. But they did have three different touchdown scores in the passing game. And Justin Rankin had 121 all-purpose yards. There were good things to be found in this beatdown. And here's the one big one. In fact, here's the one thing that I loved about this game for the Elks. In the midst of getting the teetotal shit beaten out of them, <laughs> because they did, I love the fact that Edmonton stuck to this new Edmonton Elks philosophy. Imagine Chris Jones was still the coach. Sorry to give you PTSD. But imagine he was still the coach. McLeod Bethel Thompson would have had 55 pass attempts and you wouldn't even know that the Elks had running backs on the roster. The pass to run distribution was 34 to 22. They stayed committed to that plan and that allowed McLeod Bethel Thompson to be his best self. He threw three touchdowns in that game, did not throw an interception. He only had 223 pass yards, but he put 21 points on the board through the air. 
it didn't force him to have to be a 55 pass attempt hero where he might have scored those three touchdowns but probably would have added two picks to it as well now all of a sudden you've got a crisis of confidence in this guy who is one of your 1a 1b starting quarterbacks like it put him in a position that he could still perform and still kind of be the best version of himself because of this new offensive philosophy maybe that's getting into the weeds a little bit too much but the whole game has changed with the Elks since they made their, you know, coaching change and leadership change up top. The whole game has changed for them. And the fact that they stuck to that plan in the midst of getting blown out, I loved it. And I think it it really speaks volumes to where this team is going. Unfortunately, where this team is probably not going is going to be the postseason. And I don't think it's egregious that they don't make the playoffs, right? Like, especially considering where they started this season until they finally made the right decisions in the front office. Like, I don't think anybody's going to be like, wow, it's a real failure that the Elks didn't make the playoffs this year. It's not. I don't think they're going to make it. Um, There's some wind that may affect the pass game uh, in this game, and I do kind of expect it to be a playoff-type atmosphere as every game for the rest of the year is must win for Edmonton if they do still have aspirations of going to the postseason. I do think this is probably going to wind up being a win and in for the Riders and even if it's mathematically not uh, they're going to certainly play like it is. Uh, I like the Riders in this matchup I think and that should essentially eliminate the Elks from playoff contention but again I don't think that's a failure that they don't make the playoffs. Give me the Riders to get the win in Edmonton. On the line, the Elks are taking plus two and a half. I like the Riders to win. It's a fairly small price to pay. Let's lay the minus two and a half on Saskatchewan. Total in the game set of 50 and a half. I like this number to go over too. I guess I'm over on everything this week. Over 50 and a half points in Riders. Elks, we're going to go like a 28 to 24. I think this is a pretty good number and it should only be within a point or two either way. But give me the over on that one. Riders win. Riders cover over on the point total. There you go, folks. It was a disjointed episode this week. Lots of cuts, lots of stuff that's going to wind up on the cutting room floor uh, in the recording process this week. But that's the show, and those are the picks for Week 18. We'll go over them here with you one more time. I've got the Bombers beating the Tie Cats 30 to 27 in Hamilton, but I'm taking the plus four and a half on the Tie Cats over the 50 point total. I got the BC Lions beating the Calgary Stampeders 31 to 26 in BC. I'm holding my nose and taking plus seven and a half on the Stampeders over the 53 point total. And I've got the Saskatchewan Rough Riders beating the Edmonton Elks 28 to 24, laying the minus two and a half on the Riders in a game that goes over 50 and a half points. Obviously, the fantasy game has not unlocked for this week, but I think if I'm looking at Let's let's see if I can build my team here for you in the next like two and a half minutes. Uh, okay, quarterback, um, quarterback. We're probably gonna go Kalaros, but I might go Trevor Harris. Uh, run game. William Standback is definitely gonna be in my roster this week, and the second one, I think it's going to be James Butler because I don't think Greg Bell practice is practicing i think he had a dnp so i might go james butler for my second uh running back there wide receivers it's going to be tough not to go justin mckinnis and maybe nick dembski or possibly grab somebody there on the riders as well if especially if i go trevor harris uh, at quarterback uh let's see my flex man keandre smith had a big game last week that's a possibility for sure um, maybe like a Justin Rankin in the run game, because again, I feel really good about the Elks run game either way. In in a week that all the games are going to go over, uh, I think probably spending min money on defense is probably not the worst idea. I might go with the Riders, maybe with BC. I think I'm probably going to wind up just going min money. So whichever defense is playing that costs the least, that allows me to put more money into my offensive players, that's probably going to wind up being the way that I go. 
Look at that. I cleared that in like a minute and a half. That's awesome. Thank you so much for checking out the show this week. That's it for me, Justin, Bridgewater's Finest on YouTube, Blockbuster underscore guy on Twitter. We'll see you again for week 19. We'll see you for my NFL uh, stream tomorrow night. And boy, we are coming right down to the nitty gritty of the CFL season. I bet you when we come on here next week, the playoff picture is really going to be in view.